All right, everybody, welcome to Archaeo Viking. Uh, today we have a, a special guest, um, an archaeologist that I had the uh, honor to work with about three years ago in a site in Florida, Dr. John Indodino uh, from Eastern Kentucky University. Uh, and today uh, we're going to talk about his uh, the two main sites that he's uh, worked on over the past uh, four or five, uh, five-ish years. Um, one a site in Florida called Tomoka, and then in Kentucky, uh, multiple cave uh, sites that are like sh cave shelter sites. Uh, so, um, Dr. Indana, why don't you uh, introduce yourself very quickly? Hi, I'm John Indanino. As Dane mentioned, I am um, an archaeologist. I'm working at Eastern Kentucky University, and my two main research areas are the origins of the burial mound and especially um, the rock shelters in Kentucky that have been disturbed. That's, I sort of fell into that by accident. So, so my expertise has kind of moved over towards investigating sites that have been damaged by illegal digging, um, finding the, the history that has not been destroyed in the process of searching for artifacts. Yeah. Oh, and stone tools. It's like, I'm all about the lithics. I, I yeah. love lithics. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm very much in the same thing. That's part of why I'm going to graduate school this uh, this year. So, um, and uh, okay. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, the sites you're working on, uh, specifically uh, the uh, one Tomoka and your work there, and also uh, the uh, K uh, rock shelters in Kentucky. Okay. Um, well, the, the work at Tomoka is an outgrowth of my doctoral research at the University of Florida, where I, I studied the Thornhill Lake Complex. And mm -hmm. in the process of doing that, I outlined and defined a sub-period of the middle to late archaic in the St. John's called Mount Taylor, the Thornhill Lake phase, which is characterized by um, intensified interregional interaction through the exchange of uh, exotic items like banner stones, ground stone beads, and things like that, uh, but especially the construction of sand mortuary mounds. Um, thus far, we haven't found any other sand mortuary mounds outside of the St. John's River Valley and northeast um, coast of Florida. I'm not saying there aren't, I'm just saying nobody's found convincing evidence for them. So at, the, at, at present, there's no evidence of them existing outside of the immediate St. John's River Valley and Northeast Florida, say, south of St. Augustine, north of like Daytona Beach. It's like right in that area. Uh, and so in the process of doing my dissertation research on late archaic uh, mortuary mounds without pottery, I became aware of the Tomoka mounds pretty early on through the, through the work of Bruce Piatek, who was like the first archaeologist to work in, in modern times at Tomoka back in the early 90s, and he got radiocarbon dates. So we had a radiocarbon date from the big mound, mound six. It was almost exactly spot on the same age as mound A at Thornhill Lake. So while I was doing my dissertation research, before I even finished writing it, I was already thinking about like, what's the next thing? And so I turned my, my gaze towards Tomoka. But in the intervening years, I had to finish the dissertation, apply for jobs, got a job in Kentucky, and then in 2013, I actually started the Tomoka Archaeology Project in earnest. And I brought students down over the summer for, I think, four, 13 or 14 days of field work. Um, and we did the Tomoka Archaeology Project um, stage one uh, during that period where straightforward you know, brass tacks archaeology. How many mounds are there? How old are they? Because if I'm going to study late archaic mortuary mounds, I got to figure out which ones are later kick and which ones are mortuary mounds. And we did have some data from previous research to say, it's like, well, they found human remains in these mounds, these mounds, and these mounds. Okay, that's great. But how old are they? So in cooperation with the Florida Division of Historical Resources, we worked out a testing strategy and a human remains protocol in the event that I found burials because I don't want burials. I don't want to disturb um, burials if it can all if it's at all possible to avoid it. So we were able to do that with only minor encounters with human remains, mostly teeth, um, which were reinterred, work ceased, move on elsewhere. Um, but we found out that there are four late archaic mortuary mounds um, at Tomoka. Uh, there are three, two, two, two St. John's period uh, burial mounds 
uh, and the rest are mid and mounds, mostly shell, broken tools, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so with those positive and encouraging results, we set on to the stage two of the Tomoka project, which you were part of. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that had the specific goal of collecting environmental data to reconstruct um, what the environmental conditions of Tomoka were like, because this is one of the weird things about Tomoka, there's freshwater snails uh, and other freshwater mollusks, which today, freshwater mollusks are extinct in, this, in the Tomoka River Basin, unless you get up into the deep swamps of uh, Southern Volusia County where, where the, 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 um, the tidal influence doesn't extend to. So in the river today, there's no freshwater mollusks. And how do we explain them uh, there in the past? And is there a relationship between the end of mound building and environmental disturbance related to sea level change. So those are the kinds of things that, that I was hoping to do in the second stage of the Tomoka archeology span project. And we got good data um, based on the pollen analysis of the sub midden sand dune and the midden deposits with all the Thornhill Lake phase, late archaic stuff. And then the later St. John's deposits the sand dune deposits are too harsh on, on pollen for them to survive. And there's a highly fragmented and hard to identify. But in the midden deposits that are radiocarbon dated to the Thornhill Lake phase, fresh water marsh grass pollen. Um, and then when you get into the later St. Uh, John's period deposits where there's no freshwater models, there's only oysters and hard clam, you've got salt tolerant species and no freshwater pollen. So there's a pretty good, in very coarse grained way, evidence to indicate that during time when the site was occupied and during the Thornhill Lake phase, there's a freshwater marsh ecosystem in, in the area. Um, and then things change. <laughs> uh, and we actually have freshwater snails disappearing about 4,200 years ago, oh, which okay. is after the end of the Thornhill Lake phase. Um, so Thornhill Lake phase mounding ends 4,700 Cal BP. So there's a half a millennium when folks are still there. They're doing things, um, but they've concentrated on the north half of the site. And I think they're reusing old bounds for burial, but they're building shell rings at the north end. Uh, that there's a shell oh. ring at the north end of the site. So, so they, the, they, the inhabitants of, of Tomoka, shifted from mortuary mound construction to shell ring construction but I think that they were reusing the burial mounds for interments because there are intrusive burials in the mounds and some of them date to the very end of the orange period, um, which is what 4,200 years would put us, put us at, um, well, what, in, in the orange period. And, but here's the thing, there's no orange pottery, which is uh, fiber tempered Spanish moss, not a stitch of that pottery at the site. So there's, there's some really interesting social things happening where, you know, all throughout the Southeast, especially in Georgia, South Carolina, North Florida, you have late archaic people making fiber tempered pottery, building shell rings, being, you know, Stallings culture, Tom's Creek, um, orange culture. But these folks at Tomoka are not buying into the pottery. They're, they're um, I don't know, cultural holdouts, if you will. They're <laughs> still using stone boiling in organic containers and roasting ah. pits. Um, again, no pottery until 3,600 years ago. Um, so like at the very, very end of uh, St. John's, uh, Orange and beginning of St. John's, you finally start seeing pottery at the site. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but it sort of makes sense. One of my operating hypotheses is that the people who were building mounds at Tomoka have their geographic and their probably cultural origins in the St. John's River Valley. I think they were migrants. They brought with them an architectural grammar they brought with them stone boiling. We have evidence of stone boiling in the St. John's. There's no sites contemporaneous with Tomoka on the Atlantic coast that for which we have data. They don't have, they're not using limestone for stone boiling. It looks like, a, like an alien, not space aliens, like <laughs> not local to the area. Yes, um, showing up yeah. and doing things that are like common <laughs> in the St. John's, but they show up late. They show up like at the end, 4,900 um, to about 4,700 versus the beginnings of it are about 52 to 5,600 Cal BP in the St. John's. But they all end around 4,700 Cal BP, give or take, both in the St. John's on the coast. There's some really interesting stuff going on. And I don't claim to have all the answers. I need to do a little bit more work out there. Um, but 
I've been thinking a lot about it. I haven't published on it yet, but I mean, technically that's not true. I wrote a popular article for uh, the Florida um, Adventure, Florida Archaeology Adventures magazine, uh, which, is, which is published by the Florida Historical Society. Um, so I, I guess technically I did publish on it, but not for the academics. I'm still working out how I, how I want to present it and where I want to present it. Uh, but there's some incredible stuff going on that, that um, makes me think in some ways that, you know, Tomoka represents, you know, um, a multi-ethnic neighborhood where you have folks from the St. John's moving to the coast, inter intermarrying and intermingling and living with people who are coastal dwellers. They create this somewhat unique culture in the area, but that's different when it's happening to the north and to the south on the coast. And so they're almost like a little, an isolated community. But mm, I don't know, so I'm still thinking about these things, but they're, they're definitely different and surely not unaware of what's happening around them. Um, that, and it doesn't look like Tomoka is what we might call a village. It looks like it's the kind of place where people come to do things, rituals, burial, uh, feasting, all that kind of stuff. And while they're living there, they're creating the debris of, ha the debris of habitation, but it doesn't look like a village. It's, it has a distinctly different material culture signature than habitation sites elsewhere on the coast from the same time. Fewer shell tools, fewer bone tools, um, not as many features. So it's like, what is this place? And it might be that it is kind of like a sacred precinct. Um, right, like the whole or, or I mean, I, I mean, there's probably another word for it. Um, I don't want to invoke ideas of like formalized structured religion, like a like a, a shrine or a votive location or, or anything like that. But I think people were doing, if they were living there, it was short term and it was in association with the activities uh, related to mound building, mortuary ritual, and any kind of other things that were going on there at the time. Okay, so, so, so sort of like Hopewell, perhaps? I mean, I know that's a, 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 about... A that's not a bad that. analogy. Yeah. Um, and it may yeah. be, this is a, a, a hypothesis that maybe could be tested, yeah. that the folks from the St. John's who were coming there we're not necessarily like residents of the Tomoka area, but they were like, you know, uh, pilgrims uh, <laughs> in a sense, coming from the St. John's to the coast. Maybe the personnel who came um, were fulfilling kinship and family obligations, you know, because kin, kin networks among hunter gatherers are, are the tie that binds. And so it may have just been that they were a, it was a place of coalescence where you have, uh, coastal dwellers and river dwellers coming together, doing things related to ritual and the like, and then going back and, you know, uh, inhabiting other domains like villages. Um, and so in, in a way, you know, the Hopewell sacred secular dichotomy might hold up to, to a certain degree. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have, um, for example, uh, way over in Louisiana at Poverty Point, we have similar things going on with, uh, yeah. granted, Poverty Point, the most famous, it's not the oldest, there are, there are older yeah. ones, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but still, that's a, that's a good analogy, and we do have uh, archaic sites here in Georgia, um, mm -hmm. and similar, uh, similar things. Um, and, well, these, these folks to Mocha probably had contact with um, Paris Island culture up along uh, the middle savannah. And that was going to be my um, next question: was if they had any other contacts outside of uh, John's uh, up there in North uh, West Florida. So oh, yeah. I mean, for, for sure. Okay, so the banner stones are made out of um, steatite. Now we could do some geochemical sourcing and figure out that steatite is coming from from Georgia and South Carolina, and I, I bet it is. Um, but stylistically, the banner stones are Southern ovates, Wisconsin winged which you find in, in, um, in, uh, in those contexts, um, not the, the late ones, the, the late hypertrophic Southern notched ovates that you see with like Stallings Island and, and Mill Branch. So we're talking about like Paris Island culture. So it's like, you know, the generation before who time-wise, that's about when they're building mounds on the St. John's. Ah. Um, and I don't have any, any ground stone beads at Tomoka but at Thornhill Lake, we had groundstone beads that probably had their provenance in um, Mississippi, possibly Louisiana. Oh, wow. 
that Thornhill Lake is coming from the Stallings region and, you know, the lower Mississippi Valley and converging at Tomoka. But for whatever reason, we don't have them at, um, at, uh, at Tomoka. Just the banner stones and the um, pendants made from the broken banner stone wings. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting uh, because one of the things I looked at for one of the projects I'm currently working on right now, um, which is a lithics pro project uh, that I'll be presenting uh, soon at the uh, National Conference for Undergraduate Research, um, was uh, we, we had found an archaic point that, it, that uh, was broken. Um, and of course, it went through, you know, all the typical things, you know, was it, a, you know, upward from, say, like a plowing scenario where somebody plowed because it wasn't habit and such or or anything like that but the thing is it was in the same you know long story short same exact same uh level and unit as uh, a middle woodland point uh and so you're mentioning that they were using those working banner stones uh br it brings to mind something that was going on in the middle woodland where um in florida actually where middle woodland cultures were finding uh archaic points uh, or trading for them and then ritually breaking them and putting them into similar uh, mid and mounds. Uh, Are you talking about the um, Fort Center? I believe so. I'd have to look at yeah. my paper. Yeah, Fort yeah. Center, you have middle archaic Noonan points that have had, some of them had the flake scars ground off of them. Yeah. And someone took the That's time a... to grind those biofaces to like remove yeah. the flake scars and then smash them. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. In the context. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, you do find older materials making their way into later context, um, and usually for different purposes. As an example, from the St. John's River Valley, you've got St. John's two groups uh, burying banner stones with burials around, you know, 1200, 1300 AD. <laughs> like, they, they, weren't, they weren't using banner stones, I don't think, um, but they were salvaging them, recognizing that they're interesting unique maybe associated with the ancestors and then interring them yeah um in another context so those kinds of things happen people find i mean the same way i find old you know early 20th century artifacts that every time i work in my garden it's like people living in the past encountered the past and i mean if you find a, a, a nice archaic biface in the middle woodland why not use it yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and of course, on, on the project I'm working at, because uh, I presented at SEAC also, and I, I brought up now, it's certainly possible that it still was brought up through some other event, but it's bioturbation, something like that, but bowing, it, something like that, yeah. But it's still, it's still very odd that it's in the exact same, not just same level, the same unit as a middle wood, broken middle woodland mm -hmm. uh, point. So, I, my running hypothesis is that it was one of these exotic items that was brought there by uh somebody whether it be uh what's an ancestor thing or somebody traded it or or what have you and eventually it broke but uh but yeah um so okay uh and uh has uh your hypothesis uh for tomoka and uh these other areas like uh st john's changed uh since you've done your research or has it generally uh stayed the same or um or what you know well i mean it's it's become more nuanced uh, as far back as 2016 i already had an inkling that the folks at tomoka had had very strong connections to the saint john's mm -hmm. um and sure surely mobility could explain that people just going between river and the coast periodically for whatever reason um maybe not entire populations on an annual basis but segments of populations um who who have permission through kinship ties and the like um, so I've kind of had a, a, a suspicion that folks from the St. John's were present on the coast. Were they in residence year round? That's not a Tomoka, apparently. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that was the hard thing, um, to figure out. And it may be that they were not. And the reason that I say that, and again, I haven't really like changed my mind, big picture. I'd just be like more nuanced, like fine, mm -hmm. fine tuning my, my perspective is that if there were St. John's peoples or people from the St. John's River during Thornhill Lake phase who moved to the coast and stayed there, we would expect to see that they would there would be other aspects of their material culture on the coast, like these, you know, um, burned, fragmented limestone cooking stones. So why wouldn't they use that at other sites? Why is it just like this one place? And it may be that the answer to my question is that well, the reason they're not there is because they're not there, except 
at Tomoka for very specific reasons. Okay. That's the only thing, um, may, maybe more nuanced approach that, I, that I've come to. And then there's a whole issue of um, what they were doing with the shell rings and the persistence of the use of um, freshwater mollusks. Because in all honesty, for the amount of, of food they get by collecting these little freshwater snails, your time is better spent going over to the Atlantic side of the barrier island and collecting just basketfuls of beach clams and using those. Um, and from, a, from a, an, optical, or an optimal foraging theory approach, it's like your return for investment of time is much greater going to the coast versus collecting snails out of the mud because they're small uh, because of either by saltwater intrusion uh, interfering with the life cycle or um, or over predation by humans and other animals. It's um, it, it, I think the snails are a ritually significant food for people from the St. John's. Mm. I think that's why they were being collected and eaten. Our earliest occupations at Tomoka don't show much in the way of freshwater mollusks. People are there, 51, 52, 5,000 cal BP, um, but they're collecting donax shells and eating river and um, estuarine and marine fish. They're not messing around with the freshwater mollusks until 4,900 cal BP. Then they're messing with mollusks, the freshwater. And, and why? There, there were some freshwater mollusks in the early deposits, but it's just like a couple pieces of freshwater mussel, a couple pieces of apple snail. The 4,900 cal BP, five to 10% of the shell matrix is freshwater shell from then until about 4,700 cal BP. And then later, 47 to 4,200 cal BP, it decreases uh, both in size and abundance. So there's some interesting things still to figure out, but I, I, I think that the freshwater snails, the, the, the band of mystery snail, um, was a, a ritually charged food because of its association with feasting and mortuary rituals in the St. John's. Okay. And there's isotopic data to support that freshwater snails weren't everyday fare. Um, they would have, the, the, the isotopic signatures of freshwater mollusks would have showed up in the bones of the people eating them um, <laughs> at Harris Creek or Tick Island, and they don't. <laughs> all right. We, so we, we may have to explain all, all those freshwater snails um, as something besides everyday food. They're conspicuous. There are piles of them. They're yeah. easy, easy to see. But <laughs> if, if you're just eating them on a couple times a year, it's not going to have a significant you know, impact on your isotopic composition of your bones. <laughs> so that's probably why it, ha it hasn't turned up so far. Okay. One uh, hypothesis. Yeah. You know, these are things that can be <laughs> tested. Um, um, so long story short, my thinking on Tomoka has evolved um, but it's, I have to take into consideration the, um, the affordances and constraints of the natural environment, but also the social and, uh, and cultural environment too. There's multiple populations on the landscape and people are doing different things in different places at the same time, you know, and the, the connections with the, um, with uh, Paris Island culture and the, the middle Savannah, it's like, that's a whole different culture. Those are different people. Um, and yet we have things that they produced at, at Tomoka in the mounds, at, in Mount Six anyway. Okay. All right. And um, so, so I'm, I'm, you know, judging off of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, most recent statements, I would assume, uh, and I seem to remember that those snails are the most abundant artifacts, per se, that, that we found. Um, well, I mean, the, the beach clams, the donax, that's like the main shell. Um, but the little freshwater snails, it's like, you know, we're looking for those because oh, okay. um, they're gotcha. usually an indicator of like the mound building period. So um, if I recall correctly, the unit that you worked on, we didn't find much in the way of freshwater snails. Yeah, I believe I'm remembering the donuts and mixing them yeah, up. The, yeah, the, yes. The we found quite a lot of fish bones. Yeah, well, we did find quite a lot of fish bones. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm um, know for a fact that your uh, fish bones and animal bones were the most abundant artifact. Mm -hmm. um, is that generally and the trend for most years, or, um, uh, or no? Other? It's 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 geographic at the site. Oh, um, okay. and, and and time period. Uh, the St. John's, um, anything after the Thornhill Lake phase, no freshwater um, mollusks. They're just gone. 
Um, but in the southern half of the site, south of Mound 6, really south of Mound 7, um, you have the earliest occupations and they don't have hardly any freshwater mollusks. Hmm. So the southern part of the site was occupied earliest and longest. And then it seems like the north end of the site is where you see most of, you know, from Mound 6 north is where you got like most of your archaic mounds uh, and most of your dense shell deposits. So, so there's, there's some, there's a spatial component to this. And you remember Stephen England, who was, who was mm -hmm. with us that year, yeah. like he, this is, this is what he's looking for in his master's research. Mm -hmm. So he, he's looking at some of those spatial patterns and, you know, they're, they're real patterns. Um, we, we put enough excavation units across the site to be able to say this, like, yeah, there's some places where there's just not not freshwater, there's no freshwater, not much in the way of freshwater mollusks. Mm -hmm. Now, one could argue that maybe we just didn't put them in the right place. <laughs> Entirely possible, but we can't dig up the whole site. So where we've sampled geographically, north to south, there is sort of a cutoff where you find the majority of the freshwater uh, mollusks to the north and not to the south. All right, okay. Um, and what, uh, you know, before we'll move, we move on to your um, other research, what would you say is, uh, the most exciting artifact or artifacts that you've found at Tomoka over the years? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, uh, the most interesting artifacts. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if you want to call them artifacts per se, but mm -hmm. they're, they're eco facts. Okay. Paleo feces. Oh, yeah. I found more paleo feces at Tomoka than I found really anywhere at any other site that I've ever worked at. Oh, wow. And I, I they're, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do some pretty cool real archaeological science stuff on them. I just got to find somebody who wants to do it for free. <laughs> if, if I don't have a whole bucket of money to pay them, I need, yeah. I need to find, find some folks who want to like, who might be interested in doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I have paleo feces and I think my cat knocked it off my shelf. I actually have um, a 3D printout of one of the, the Tomoka turds, as it's called, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to find that person to, to walk up to and here, take my bucket of copper lights. <laughs> I mean, but the kinds of information we can get yeah. out of it is incredible. I mean, we can extract yeah. DNA. Yeah. We can extract pollen. We can, um, we can, ex we figure out, it's like, are they human or are they animal? Um, yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. But um, if they are human, are they male or female? How old are they? How's their diet? They got parasites. Mm -hmm. it's like, this, is all, this is all incredible stuff we can learn. Um, well, well, and if they're animal, you could say, well, are, you know, for example, are they dogs and are they, you know, or are they wolves? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, now as for an, like an artifact, I mean, <laughs> and here again, uh, there weren't a lot of artifacts from Tomoka. Um, we had a really cool carved bone pin. Um, the Florida Public Archaeology Network Northeast has a, a little gallery of Tomoka artifacts they did 3D scans of. Mm. Um, so there's a really cool carved bone pin that dates towards the end of the mound building, about 4,800 Cal BP. Um, it's got like an eye motif, like nested almond-shaped eyes with lots yeah. of cross hatching and curved designs around it. It's pretty cool. Okay. Um, but what's most interesting, what I think what stood out to me is that I found two bi-face fragments the oh. entire site. Oh, yeah. well, I, I think about three by face fragments, um, one distal, one stem, and one very tiny, complete, um, passable by face about, I mean, about yay big. Oh, wow. Like it's a little over an inch. Mm. Um, it's been severely reworked and we found it in a column sample. So um, I think the site is notable for the stuff that we didn't find. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so mm, not a lot of cool artifacts, although, although the coolest artifact we found were the shell drinking cups, the shell cups oh, that we found um, in test unit 10, dated between 45 and 4,700 Cal BP. Uh, I had residue analysis performed on them and they were used for brewing plant-based teas. Oh, wow. Not the black drink. We tested specifically for that, no black yeah. drink, but they were using um, waxy leaved plants um, that were aromatic. They had a benzene, an arom aromatic benzene ring. Um, oh, okay. So I'm going down my, my checklist of plants and then it's like, okay, well, red bay, um, possibly cedar, you know, like cedar berries oh, yeah. um, and uh, wax myrtle. Oh, okay. So, you know, so, sort of camphory smelling aromatic plants. So, uh, and they're using fresh water. Uh, we can say that. <laughs> and 
in one of the vessels, there were fragments of ground up human hair. Oh, okay. whether that was there intentionally or accidentally, it was human hair that had been broken up in some fashion, mechanically, huh. um, and somehow became incorporated into the tea yeah, and then got embedded yeah. in the vessel. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but in terms of finding like a banner stone or a Noonan point a foot long, it's like, mm. yeah. Mm. Well, and 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 what and I do remember we uh, uh, Sean Norman and I we we found that um uh that um uh, ads that was carved out of uh, yeah yeah the shell ads yeah yeah that's, that's like that is the only genuine shell tool we found at the site. Yeah. which is another reason for suspecting that the site really wasn't a long-term habitation because um, 40 miles north uh, near St. Augustine, the Crescent Beach Midden that was excavated um, at different times. I mean, they were finding like several shell adzes, shell axes, lots of bone bins, but, you know, and it's a much smaller site than Tomoka. Yeah. With much less excavation and they still found more tools than we did. <laughs> well, that's so, a lot, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, well, and then if it's a ceremonial center of some sort, you know, that would that make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also I also remember you, you, you had said, oh, I've given uh, when I was there, I said, oh, I've given up on finding a point uh, this week. And then yeah. like the, as after 10 minutes after you walk off, I find that uh, I find a point in the, the little stem. Yeah. yeah. And it's yep. just like, uh, well, so but uh, OK, so um, why don't you uh, tell us about your. Um, rock shelter work and like what led you uh to begin work uh, the research there uh, i believe you said it was by accident uh yeah uh actually almost all of my archaeology in kentucky has happened not necessarily by like my own specific research interests but just like opportunities fall fall into my lap um the first three years that i was at eku i did field schools at whitehall state historic site which is a late 18th to, you know, um, plantation uh -huh. um, built in 1797 um, and still exists today. And it was in the same family until 1903 when it became, uh, well, it's still in the same family, but it became not a residence, but like a, a tenancy. Uh, people like would rent it and, and farm it out. Um, anyway, big house, plantation, really wealthy, important family. And, you know, the the president of the garden club talked to the park manager who called the department who then put them in touch with me. And I started doing a field school on a historic site. The prehistoric stuff that I, that I've been doing in rock shelters happened a lot of the same way uh, where the supervisory archeologist for Daniel Boone national forest, just, you know, socially came to me and said, Hey, you ever interested in doing some, some field schools in Daniel Boone national forest. I'm like, maybe, you know, what do you, what do you got? And so we started talking. Uh, she put me in contact with the London District Ranger, who was closest to campus. Because one of the things, one of the big considerations for my field schools is that I don't want to put a field school experience out of the reach of a student. Mm -hmm. I want students to be able to, to do the field school. So there's no like sleep away field schools. You're not going to be gone Monday through Friday or you know six weeks at a time. It's like we meet at point A in the morning, we go to the site work at the site and you're back on campus or in town by like three thirty, four 4 o'clock. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, so I, I want something close to campus. And so working with the London district archeologist um, who just retired this year at, at the end of last year. So now, now I got to have a new working relationship with somebody. I, they haven't hired anybody yet. And so I'm just like, uh Oh, what are we going to do for 2023? <laughs> um, our, our, our five-year agreement expired at the end of last year. So we got to come up with a new five-year agreement. Uh, anyway, yeah. so I'm talking and she's like, well, you know, there's, there's a bunch of sites along this sandstone bluff line. It's close to the road that leads right to campus. Easy peasy. It's like 35, 40 minutes, depending on if it gets stuck behind a track or a tractor or not. Mm -hmm. Very rural. And so we go out there, we check it out. Prehistoric rock shelters, three of them. Um, and one open air site that had, um, been impacted by forest road construction. So she's like, we know nothing, virtually nothing about these sites. They were uh, found in like the early 1980s. It was all based on surface survey. So they collected surface um, artifacts, which suggested mostly late prehistoric. So we're talking about like um, middle woodland through late woodland. We don't have Mississippian in, in my part of the country. Um, we're, we're Mississippian adjacent, but Fort Ancient culture is it lacks all the hierarchy 
apparently, and big mounds and plazas and elites that you get with 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 um conventional middle Mississippi and stuff. Anyway, so it looks late, most of it. So in 2016, um, after working for a year to get my ARPA permit, um, get solicit and receive um, input from 14 Native American tribes who have some kind of historical tie to Kentucky, including the Cherokee, yeah. um, several bands. And um, nobody had any problems with it. You know, because I'm on federal land, we comply with NAGPRA. Uh, I haven't found any human remains in the shelter. Fingers crossed that we keep that up. Yeah. Um, but the purpose of us being there is because these sites are near points of public access. They're pretty easy to spot and they've been looted. Mm. So, so I'm working on archaeological sites that are in danger of, of the, you know, utter destruction. And I'll be honest, um, looking at some of these sites, I was just like, eh, well, it's like, in order to comply with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and as part of the mission of, you know, um, Daniel Boone National Forest and the U.S. Forest Service, they have to evaluate their sites. That's what we're here to do. I'm putting on my cultural resource management cap that I wore for like 15 years <laughs> and uh, approach the, the sites not from necessarily explicit research agendas like I did at Tomoka. It's like, I got questions. It's like, I'm very focused. Where at um, the rock shelter sites, my initial approach was it's like, well, you know, let's just see how extensive the damage from the looting is. Identify the cultural components that are there stratigraphically. Find any features. Let's just see what we have. Um, and so in a way, what we have found is what's driving my new research interests. And it turns out my, my, my new research focus is um, data recovery from heavily looted and damaged sites. Ah, yes. So at first, you know, glance at these, some of these sites, it's like, man, there's potholes, there's hills in these rock shelters. I'm looking at the first time I went, I was like, one of them, the one we excavated in 2021, I looked at it, it's like, oh man, this thing is busted there's some you know the students will learn methods they'll they'll certainly understand what disturbed stratigraphy looks like mm -hmm. by the time we're done yeah um but the first week of the the um of excavations in the rock shelter in 2016 within an hour of starting field work we found the base of a kirk corner notch point 9,9500 years old at that point i'm like well, that's older than I expected. Um, and so in the, in the Western part of the shelter, we found intact early archaic deposits with features, diagnostic artifacts, and even very faint midden deposits and the occasional preservation of botanical and um, fauna remains. And that ain't all. In the middle of the shelter, um, that's where all the, the looter back dirt ended up going. We actually placed our excavation units um, where the looter back dirt piles were and found intact deposits underneath them. Going back to 9,666 Cal BP, we had a radiocarbon date. And that wasn't even like the lowest deposits we encountered. That was just the lowest that we could get radiocarbon dates from. So I might have a 10,000 10, year old rock shelter there and it gets better, Dane, it gets oh, better. Wow. We have really good early archaic stuff. We also have really deep middle archaic midden deposits with Stanley stemmed projectile points. We've got a, a, a Fort Ancient component where we had like in the front of the shelter, 30 or 40 triangular projectile points. Oh, wow. With midden deposits with botanical remains. Um, so the, the, um, the, we had something like uh, 12 or 13 features. And we had um, amaranth, you know, kinopod, goosefoot, and our oh. late archaic feature dated to 3,400 Cal BP. So this is like at the beginning of the Eastern agricultural complex. Yeah. Um, and from the midden deposits at the front of the shelter, we also got um, pumpkin and squash. We had grape seed, black ras raspberries and blue or um, blackberries. So we had, we had a whole bunch of good stuff. And we even had kinopod dated to the 9,000 year old level. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it appears folks were messing around with those early plants a lot earlier than we thought. Um, really? So here's this just jacked up looted. The back of the shelter was just blown out down to like the gravelly subsoil. 
still found a little bit of stuff there. But as we move to the far extremes of the shelter and out from the, in the middle into the front, there's intact deposits. Hmm. So, so, you know, talking to the, to the Forest Service archaeologists, they're like, yeah, it's probably National Register eligible. So here's a site. It's been dug, dug into purportedly for over 50 years. And it, despite all that damage, it still retains intact deposits with integrity um, dating from the early archaic up to like the late woodland. Oh, wow. that's, that's amazing. That, um, and then broad thing that's a broad yeah and too. and then yeah 2018 our, our field school went like that another rock shelter not eligible we had like 123 flakes no features disturbed deposits it's just blown out not eligible but that's okay they can't all be eligible and have features and cool botanical yeah. remains um but we did an excavate a site an open air site that had the um forest road going through it and uh it's it's a short-term habitation multiple habitations mostly during the late archaic there's a tiny trace of early archaic tiny trace of middle archaic tiny trace of late woodland but mostly like late archaic um and so lots of biface production and basically people are coming there and they're refurbishing their hunting kits it's like you know worn out stubby little biofaces with asymmetric blades i even had a a brewerton eared notched point that's about that about yay big Mm. and it's like the, the distal end looks like this there's like there's nowhere to go in terms of making this thing pointy anymore yeah the tiniest little stubby thing anyway so they're wearing out their tools they're collecting local um gravel trip gravels from the creek and they're bringing in a couple kilometers to the site and they're chipping out new tools production failures tons of debitage blown out worn out old tools it's a a pretty classic retooling site yeah um, um, not a lot of features just just two yeah. like rock hearths and that's about it okay uh and how, what what would you say like the debitage uh is it dominated by say tertiary flakes or uh primary and secondary or can see you... mm, it, okay that whole triple cortex typology i i don't use it oh yeah um okay. i i have a different approach that does include um cortex but here's the problem so much of that shirt from the creeks locally um, is really thin tabular pieces mm. surrounded by cortex. So ah. even your tertiary flakes will have cortex. Ah. So um, I use flake size distribution, average weights, um, the amount of cortex, um, but also the proportions of, of different flake categories um, using the Sullivan and Rosen method of complete proximal, medial, distal, and non-orientable oh, to look at biface reduction versus core reduction we've got a mixed assemblage skewed towards bifaces so they're doing some some um some core reduction on sites probably produce flakes for flake tools although with so much debitage why would you need to i mean literally there's just thousands of flakes everywhere um but regardless that site unimpressive as it is it's an open air ridge top late archaic site and very few of those have been excavated in the part of daniel boone national forest and the Cumberland Plateau, where I work. Oh, so okay. it's pro it is probably also National Register eligible. Um, I wasn't optimistic about that, but turns out I was wrong. Hmm. Um, and then it brings us to our other rock shelter, heavily looted. The western half, eastern half of the site, western? Western half of the site um, has huge rock fall. So it's like most of the site uh, wouldn't have been accessible depending on when the rock fell um, but also very shallow soil development there so deposits on that side of the site super shallow very few artifacts uh, most everything is on the east eastern side of the site um, and even there because it's such a small area heavily impacted by looting like the worst looted rock shelter that i've worked at so far of the three it's like the worst but I thought we were going to finish early. I had a plan B. It's like, well, we can go to this other site if, uh, if we finish with this one real fast. We didn't. What happened was we started finding intact deposits towards the front of the shelter near the drip line. And then we started finding um, um, midden deposits. Then we started finding features. And <laughs> then um, at one of the site, at the farthest end of the site near the edge of the rock shelter, I had two students actually put a one by two in on top of the looter piles wow. and excavate through the looter backfill as though it was a cultural deposit because it is in a sense yeah 
Um, and so they, they treated it like it was intact deposits um, and then, you know, stopped when they got to like the actual intact deposits and began excavating those. And somewhere around a meter below surface, sort of finding early archaic artifacts. Ah. And we have an intensive Kirk corner notch component um in this rock shelter deep we had one level that had a thousand flakes a thousand flakes that unit produced i think something like six thousand flakes which is half the debitage from the entire site hmm. so we've got at this one spot in it like a really intensive biface production from the early archaic but we've also got late archaic we've got woodland we have lots of limestone tempered pottery we um we had uh 11 features um one of them uh, I just got the botanical analysis uh, results back uh, in the last couple of weeks, and it looks like a like a late summer, early fall occupation. Oh, um, very little nutshell. So, so they're not there using hickory and um, an oak and acorn um, and and walnuts like like I would expect if it was like a, a primarily fall occupation. The other one, the, the site with all the with all the stuff in, that they excavated in 2016 that had a lot of hickory nut, especially associated with the early archaic. So, so we've got this woodland thing going on where it looks like it's um, probably short term, uh, late summer, early fall. We've got grapes, we've got um, persimmon, we've got raspberry seeds, we've got more quinopod, pigweed, uh, um, maygrass. It's like the, the Eastern yeah. agricultural complex. Yeah. So we got that stuff there. So it's also probably like late summer, early fall. Um, and then we found the petroglyphs. Ah, yes. There, there, there were five turkey tracks, basically like three little, like little yeah. turkey footprints yeah. on on one of the one of the sandstone roof fall boulders that we didn't find until like the fifth week of field school, until uh, the Forest Service archaeologist during lunch just started brushing sand off of one of the boulders, and she's like, "Hey, look at this." I'm like, it's like, is that what I think it is? Turkey tracks. Um, yeah. And the, the orientation, due north, magnetic north. Hmm. The turkey tracks are, are heading north. There's five of them. Um, that was feature number 11. Um, and it's only the, I figure, I forget if it's the sixth or the seventh petroglyph site in that um, ranger district in the forest. Most of them are up in the Red River Gorge area uh, to our north. So... <sighs> That site that I anticipated us like finishing early, it was just completely blown out and destroyed. Nope. Intact deposits, early archaic, Kirk, early archaic, um, well, late early archaic. So you have like the Kanawha and the um, St. Albans points. And then we have um, late archaic, the uh, Muram Trimble cluster, and a tiny little smattering of like late prehistoric stuff. Ah. And, and middle woodland. We got middle woodland yeah. too, but mostly pottery, not a lot of diagnostic middle woodland stone tools. Okay. So, so, I, so, so now my thing is it's like, show me your screwed up rock shelters. I mean, <laughs> let me get in there and look at your, your blown out, torn up, looted out rock shelters. Because uh, in terms of okay, putting my cultural resource management hat on, it's like for land managers, it's like y'all need to think real long and hard about whether or not you should protect those those damaged and looted sites. And you you do not know what you have until you put in some excavation units. Yeah. Just a surface inspection of those sites, it'll identify presence absence. You might get lucky and find some diagnostics, but you need to get in there and and really treat those as still potentially eligible, even if they've been had the heck looted out of them. You, prove it. Prove it. Uh, and so related to that, um, hopefully, well, I, I, I gotta, make, I gotta make some, some emails, but, um, I'm slated to go on sabbatical next spring. And one of the articles that I'm going to be writing during that is related to my work in Daniel Boone National Forest and how mm -hmm. sites that have I look to be compromised in terms of national register eligibility. We need to rethink that. Um, but the twist on it is I've also got like the materiality of like looters. It's like we've collected looter artifacts. Yeah. Their lunches, their leftovers from their lunches, their their broken um, oil lamps, um, other stuff they bring to the shelter with them. But also, this is the most important thing. I'm super excited about this. 
because I made my students excavate through the looter back dirt, we actually know what they're missing. So when somebody loots the site, you know, there, I, I forget how I described it. It's, it's definitely artifact focused digging. They're want yeah. specific things. Yeah. And so they'll just like bone features. One of our features we found a hearth partially dug into by a, by a looter. And we have a partially destroyed feature that we salvage tons of wood, going to get ready to from it. Um, but like all that stuff, it's like, what, what are we losing because of looting? We can quantify it because yeah. I treated everything like it was an artifact. So I, everything the looters have dug up, it's like, we got it. You yeah. know, I, I, re I recovered their stuff, including specific looter behaviors like caching um, big flakes and biface fragments they don't want. They had a little tiny niche in the rock shelter where they would put their, their big finds, photographed it, collected it, um, and now we can compare that against what they tossed out in their back dirt versus whatever, whatever they took away. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of like that research, the, being in the field actually took me in a direction I never expected to go. But I still get to like play with cool early archaic rocks, yeah. uh, which is very exciting. So I get to, I'll be writing a paper about the early archaic um, in, in those rock shelters. And it looks like it's two different um, uses of the shelter. One appears to be a fall habitation based on deer, turkey bones, and nutshell. And the other one appears to be just like biface manufacturing, probably in warm weather. Ah, okay. Yeah, and they're not far away. They're probably maybe 300 yards apart from each other, just down a sandstone <laughs> bluff. Okay, yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. Well, and it's and it's <laughs> good that you're you, you know doing uh, doing this this work and looking at you know looter behavior. I mean, especially with you know. Um, uh, as as I know, and I'm sure you're very aware of, you, all the people in the past year or so who've been looting or damaging petroglyph sites, especially including in in the state I live in, Georgia, uh, Track Rock Gap, which um, I heard about that. Yeah, I was, I, and, and you know, and I I was mad about it that it happened, but also I was mad at mad about it even more because uh, and this is not the the, the uh, Site, uh, the site managers or anyone's fault uh because i actually didn't talk to them but i was uh for my birthday my wife asked me what i want i was like well i want to go and see you know local sites that i haven't seen before and so we mm -hmm. drove up to northeast georgia to go look at track rock Gra uh, gap and i get up there and i see the yellow caution tape and i'm like i'm dumb i forgot that they got vandalized last week and so they're probably still repairing it so which again i don't blame right. the 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 site managers at all but that still annoys me that you know people can, you know have the ability to go and see these sites and all they're doing is destroying them and ruining it for people who just want to go and look at the history of the area so and, and it makes you wonder so are, are they there because they want to destroy the 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 petroglyphs or are they there because they want to like take a concrete saw and saw it out and like bring it home well like, is, some, that, is that their yeah. intent well some of them like a uh, track right gap they spray painted some of them so from right. what i understood from what i understood in the article uh, the news article i read about it um as we both know i, I, I also news articles don't always uh portray all the information about uh like <laughs> papers or portray, always portray it the way it should be to take information out of context like great example mm -hmm. the, the the paper that came out like a week ago did you know did a meteor in the hopewell <laughs> civilization that's all over the place that's like well I, i've read the actual paper and no that they they said maybe the drought caused by the comet caused social upheaval that led to a very slow decline of the Hopewell mm -hmm. proper, but also, you know, that doesn't take into account all the other Hopewell cultures in the interaction sphere, sphere such as, right. uh, say, Swift Creek here in Georgia, you know, Swift Creek mm -hmm. and Carsville culture here in Georgia, and then other places as well. So it, it, sort of like uh, when Cahokia fell, you know, just because Cahokia fell in 1200, that didn't mean it really anything because so Etowah, Moundville, et cetera, were all, Spiro, were all still very powerful and actually on the rise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then, and, and, yeah. yeah. 
and yeah. the, and then later on uh the Kusa and chiefdom and uh Tuscaloosa chiefdoms and, and such that were developing into sort of pseudo empire states that you know they weren't I, I don't want any viewers watching this to think they were literal empires like say the uh triple alliance or the Aztec empire or you know triple alliance is the proper term for the Aztec empire uh, or the Inca empire um but they were they were close i mean if you look at for example a map of the kusa chiefdom it goes all the all through uh north carolina it goes through the western half of northern north and south carolina the eastern half of tennessee all of northwest georgia and mm -hmm. through a huge chunk of, of north and central alabama that's a rather large area so again you that, see these that, that is a complex fire. chiefdom yeah, that's a complex yeah. chiefdom. That's it's it's becoming it's close to becoming sort of an empire kingdom like thing, and it's interesting, you know, to also note. And this is a trend we see in the Americas, also in and Europe and Asia. Uh, you know, empires tend to develop in the south. You know, the Roman Empire in China and such, and then in the north, you get more tribal societies like the Germanic tribes hmm. or. Uh, the nomadic step horseman and such i mean then that, that's you know and of course civilization is subjective um mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are trying to move away from the idea of civilization but still so that's a, so you know there's that but yeah uh well it sounds like you're doing quite a lot of good work uh and such with these uh rock shelters and such uh and have mm -hmm. shown that definitely you don't need to count out a site because looters got to it but also showing that you know we need to actually look at these sites that looters did and, and you know also i kind of i learned that lesson working in florida on yeah. shell mounds that have been like commercially mined or or vandalized it's like you know a lot of those sites still possess incredible data potential has a lot of been lost absolutely is it all lost as and, and no is it worthy of protection Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I sort of took that mindset when, when I came up here and I didn't even really think about it until probably, you know, the second fuel squad. I'm just like, this is just like all the sites that I used to work at down in Florida, that the Cheryl sites in the St. John's that have been like looted or, you know, where Clarence Moore got there first, you know, looted. Yeah, same thing. Um, yeah. But at least Clarence Moore kept notes and he yeah. published and we have his collection. So as much as people vilify Clarence Moore, I'm, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Compared to many of his compatriots and contemporaries, uh, he did a much better job. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Well, um, uh, thank you for uh, coming on to the uh, to my channel and uh, t um, talking about these sites. Uh, you know, uh, something I've been thinking, uh, what you know for for viewers any viewers who might be interested in archaeology and such obviously you and i know how to uh get into the field of archaeology as i mean i have a a ba in archaeology and i'm going to graduate school this year uh for archaeology and you already have your your doctorate um do you have any rec you know recommendations or tips or anything for any of our viewers who might be interested in history and archaeology and how to get into uh the field, uh, whether it be as an amateur or going to school to eventually go to graduate school and become a professional archaeologist. So, uh, absolutely, uh, I will. I will start with uh, the amateurs first. Um, if there is an archaeological society in your state, um, preferably one that involves professionals too, like the Florida Anthropological Society, it's amateurs and professionals. And a lot of times the amateur societies will, will do field work. They'll work on projects in the local communities, helping archaeologists. Um, my, my work at Tomoka accepts volunteers whenever, whenever I do it. Um, field school is different, um, but you know, there, there are archaeologists who do want to work with you, uh, public, uh, interested amateurs. Um, and I'm, I say, I, I say like, like um, reputable archaeological societies who work with professionals because there are archaeological societies who just go out and loot sites mm -hmm. that's not archaeology um so if you're interested in doing archaeology related things find out if there's an archaeological society the florida public archaeology network plus the florida anthropological society there's lots of opportunities to get involved but that's just like one example um arkansas has the arkansas archaeological survey find out what your state has um another thing that you could do 
is to contact uh, universities, see if they have volunteer opportunities or public outreach or do things like that. Um, I did that for the, my first three field schools out at Whitehall. I had public archaeology days. Bring the family. Let's pick their screens. And I have my students there working with them, which brings me to students. If, if you want to be an archaeologist when you grow up, whatever age that happens, you can do it. Um, but in order to do it as a professional, you know, you need a couple of things. One, usually a degree, a BA at least, in anthropology or related field like history. Um, I highly recommend a field school um, where you get basically your learner's permit to do archeology, span learn the basics. You learn how to conduct field work, you learn how to do basic lab work, things like that. Uh, and then as a student of whatever age you are, volunteer if you can. Um, That's the age old question. How do I get experience if I can't get a job? How do I get a job if I don't have experience? Volunteerism is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And right. that can, that, I mean, and I realize that for some people that puts constraints on both your time and your budget. Because, you know, people got jobs. It's like, man, I can't just be given up like X amount of time to just like do an internship or, or, or volunteer. It's like, well, when I was undergrad, I would volunteer like on weekends on a project. Mm -hmm. And it might not be a lot, but I mean, that's how I got my first job in archaeology. I had done volunteer work doing phase one surveys and phase two excavations. Mm -hmm. And autobiographical note, I never had a field school. Same here. Same. Here. Uh, and I have a PhD. Yeah. yeah. I'm a college professor. Um, <laughs> I just, I did a lot of volunteer work and I worked my summers during my junior and senior years of college doing CRM. And when I graduated, I got a job. Mm -hmm. And then I started grad school a year later. So, I mean, and there's a number of tracks. I don't want to say necessarily that uh, experiences in, uh, in archaeology are just field related. Because there's a lot of archaeology that has nothing to do with digging stuff up. Curation, laboratory work, um, historical research, GIS, remote sensing and geophysics. I mean, yes, you have to go in the field for that. But you know, these are things that don't necessarily require you to dig holes in the ground for long periods of time. So there's other skill sets that somebody can develop in um, archaeology. So there's there's more than one path you can take uh, for a career in archaeology. But I will say this, develop skills. The more things you can do, the more employable you'll be. So if you can do historical research, write reports, work in a lab, do GIS, it's like you, you you're useful. You know, you, you, you can perform tasks. Um, and of course, you can probably still dig holes too, um, yeah. if needed. But if, if the, the field life is not for you, there's other things you can do. Like, you know, learn how to do stone tool analysis, ceramic analysis, become a zooarchaeologist. Kentucky doesn't have enough zooarchaeologists. The one we had is moving. So I mean, literally the one we had yeah. is moving. So now what do we do? <laughs> I, I have to talk to people in Tennessee now. Because they're the closest. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and, and I 100% agree. You don't need uh, necessarily field schools because I did exactly what you did. I um, volunteered. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, Tomoka, I saw your ad and I reached out to you mm -hmm. and volunteered a, a week. And I was glad to have you. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, yes. And it's like, and uh, uh, I was also... <laughs> I was uh, there with your uh, with two of your students as well as um, uh, Sean Norman and Stephen England, mm -hmm. both of whom I'm still mm -hmm. friends with on Facebook. Uh, yep. And so yeah, so it, and that's how you build your network. Yes, exactly. Your stuff like that, and and I mean, you can have like a field school and do lots of volunteer experience, but it really helps to know people. So prospective students, student archaeologists out there of all ages and, and mm -hmm. uh, amateurs go to the archaeology conferences of your state. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them these days are virtual because of COVID. So you can do it from like the comfort of your own home. Um, but networking is really important mm -hmm. because it's like, oh yeah, I work with Dane. It's like, I yeah. totally recommend him for grad school or a job or, or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So, and that's, you know, I, I, I don't want to feel like I'm some kind of power broker, but I have not recommended somebody for a job and they didn't get it. Because yeah. somebody that I knew was hiring them, it's like, it was like, would you hire? I'm like, no. 
<laughs> okay. That's all I need to know. Yeah. Or absolutely, you're a fool to pass them up. And it's like, okay, I'll hire them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I now, have a lot one, of good One last thing about field schools, a, yeah. a lot of job ads do require a field school. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you don't have a field school, but you've got two years of like field experience, volunteering or working, it's like, do not not shoot your shot. It's like, yeah. if you got the practical experience, don't let that field school dissuade you in your cover letter that you write, say, hey, I don't have a field school, but I worked for, you know, this archaeologist for, you know, over two years volunteering on weekends, doing these things. And I worked for a CRM firm for a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's there's your experience because that's that's more experience than you get in a six week field school. Yeah. On my on my uh, re on my uh, resume, I have every every dig I volunteered for uh, chronologically set up on it. So, you, so yeah, exactly. And that's actually consequently one of the ways I got my current job at uh, a historic mm -hmm. site. So because also yeah. I had a, hist a history degree prior, I got that's another thing uh, that you that's good that you don't have to do. But it's um, if you don't want to go through the first two years of just going through basically nothing but English and math before you get to the actual anthro stuff, go get mm -hmm. to a two year school for a history degree or something like that. And you'll go ahead and get that knocked out. And plus you already have a degree, which mm -hmm. looks good. And you can, you know, easier, more easily get a job while you're going to finish in the last two years at a four year school. Cause I technically transferred to my four year college um, rather than graduate but i that, but i still technically have an associate's degree because i did complete those two years at mm -hmm. georgia highlands college so i have a history degree and an anthropology degree in basically half the time in if you were to only do it say you know two years and then four years or right. four years so again you don't have to do I, that but that's a good way to do it so i took the same track i, I went to community college my first two years in fact that's how i became an archaeologist yeah um i found an artifact thought it was really cool wanted to go dig some up could have been a looter but my mom said maybe you shouldn't take a class in archaeology i did the professor offered um volunteer activity or volunteer opportunities i took advantage of them hooked yeah my my freshman year of college by the way it's the same guy that sean norman and i uh work with at the gulf archaeology research institute mm -hmm. gary ellis he's yeah. the reason why i'm an archaeologist now yeah because as a kid at a junior college, saw those classes, took them. That was it. So I transferred. They didn't have an anthropology major or minor. I've got, it's called College of Central Florida now, but it used to be Central Florida Community College. Mm, yeah. Changed the name, but still the same place. Um, which is to say they didn't offer any anthro major or minor. So I was like a, what was I? Gosh, liberal arts. <laughs> ah, I was a liberal arts major, but I took the two classes that I could take there. So I was like, eh. yeah, but you know, I, I got those two intro courses in anthropology and archeology. span And that like set the stage. Couldn't wait to get to the university of South Florida and take like all anthro, all archeology span all the time. Yeah. And that's basically what I did. Yep. And I did the same, a similar thing. And I took both, uh, anthro uh, both anthro slash archaeology and also history courses because mm -hmm. i'm i'm a firm believer most archaeologists are anyways but i'm a firm believer that history need you know what needs to work together with with archaeology i mean it does but oh for sure but there's uh, uh, i mean yeah do, do archaeologists do history i mean kind of yeah um we write the histories of people who didn't write their own histories yeah um so we, we have a very serious responsibility to, mm -hmm. to do it as fairly and, and yes, write these exactly and, uh, well, speaking yeah. for somebody else which yeah. sounds very colonial but it's like i try, yeah. I try to do my best I try to yeah. be fair yeah well and well and, uh, and an archaeologist another archaeologist i know um john honor camp who uh has since retired but he worked at uh the university of tennessee in uh chattanooga uh, and he was telling me when i worked with him on a site in south georgia he was telling me uh about one site where basically the site manager was like he went on some sort of rant about 
uh, archaeology is not important. It's on, on, only history. You know, we've already recorded everything that needs to be known or something like that through history. And so <laughs> he told me, he's like, he told me, uh, no, it was the assistant site manager, not the site manager, but assistant site manager. But he's told me uh, that he, as he was digging through the site, they found a prehistoric uh, American Indian site that was not recorded in any of the documents. Uh, and he also said, he was say that guy didn't work there for very long after that because he apparently was hindering other people. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but uh, from what I understand, I could I could be remembering that wrong. So, uh, but the, but that's still a, an important message, you know. You, not not every history is written down in documents. For one thing, as mm -hmm. valuable as primary documents are, and as much as we yes. as historians and archaeologists use them they can still lie, <laughs> you know. Um, or a good example is uh, the the now heavily disproven um, guns, germs, and steel books that use the old environmental determinism hypothesis uh, without mm -hmm. consulting any of the experts on the subject talking you know he uses uh, oh yes the author, the author i'm very familiar with guns germs and steel yes the author uses the spanish accounts of the conquest of like inca empire which is his primary thesis of the book uh as gospel when for one thing <laughs> pizarro and his brothers who wrote the main pizarro accounts uh paint a very different picture from what the everyday soldiers say but also too the spaniards were incentivized to lie as much as they could because if they make themselves look as awesome as possible to the spanish king they could get maybe more land and more money and stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, so they're saying, oh, we, we charged into an army of 10,000 Inca warriors with just me and this one other guy, and we won, and we're, you know, this is why we're so great. Give us more land. When Pedro Pizarro, for example, is saying the opposite, he's like, uh, when we, and this is a, a direct quote, he's like, when we saw the, when we saw Atahualpa and his Incan army of 10,000 soldiers marching towards the square in Carjamanca, uh, uh, with our only, I think it was like a hundred Spaniards. He said, the men began relieving themselves of their own water. So basically he was saying they were pissing on themselves. Uh, right. he was, so uh, that's, that's something to remember. And that's unfortunately a lot of people um, such as uh, Graham, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Hancock like to do is they like to take accounts uh out of context be it mm -hmm. primary or oh, yes. academic yeah uh so mm -hmm. so that's so that's something to remember too is is history and archaeology most definitely need to work together they will always have to work together uh and frankly we can, one can't live without the other because a lot of times we do you know obviously not with prehistoric or say paleolithic or neolithic sites but you know in sites that you know do have historic context we need that those primary documents to find necessarily where they are because for maybe the, the we don't know where the side of this x battle was or something like that mm -hmm. so yeah. well it's interesting, interesting you mentioned that my my after after I, i'm gonna write a book about tomoka and thornhill lake one day mm -hmm. uh, probably starting after my sabbatical but um, the next big writing project after that will be on the history of the peoples written out of history at uh -huh. the place where I do where I did my first three field schools in Kentucky, Whitehall. It's like, yeah, it was built by a, a wealthy family descended from wealthy landowners who came over um, at or before the Mayflower people arrived into the Virginia colony. It's like they were already rich and famous and became the aristocracy in Kentucky. But um, at Whitehall, where I did my work, it's like there's precious little mention in the histories of these big famous people, General Green, Green Clay, um, Cassius Marcellus Clay, who is both a general and an ambassador, you know, uh, local Kentucky politician, second cousin of Henry Clay, super rich, super famous. But at his on his land were children, enslaved peoples, right. emancipated peoples who used to be enslaved. Um, white and white tenant farmers, mm -hmm. like post 1903, they make up part of the archaeology and history of of Whitehall. But how much do they talk about tenant farmers on the site? Not a lot. They mention them, enslaved peoples, 
Yeah, I mean, they're mentioned too, but most of the history is focused on the big people mm. in the official history. So, so my next writing project is to actually begin doing the oral history and, and the archaeology of those people who left very little but like the things they left behind. Mm -hmm. So, so archaeology, I mean, historic archaeology is very historical, but archaeology writ large is where they're dealing with like Paleolithic groups. I mean, they had histories. No. We just, they're just not written down and we don't have the stories. So we have to reconstruct them from the things in the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would and I would argue and a lot of people, uh, indigenous included, and I tend to agree, uh, would argue that uh, petroglyphs are a form of language in and of themselves. They're a form of writing. I mean, well, for one mm -hmm. thing, look at the hieroglyphics. I mean, that's a more advanced version. But, you know, so that's another thing to consider, you know, mm -hmm. do these are these there's, there's more than one way to communicate. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, like, are these people's history really not written down, or do we need to reconsider what is a way of writing things down? So it's funny you mention that. Hang on a second. Let, yeah. me, let me go to my book my bookshelf for a minute. Okay. Pull off this book by my colleague Asa Randall. Ah, yes. Constructing histories. Um, people can write histories in the landscape by building freshwater shell mounds mm -hmm. or earthen mounds. Like those, those things communicate to people through time and across space. Yeah. Um, you know, so you mean petroglyphs, um, medicine wheels out West, mounds, mound struck, um, shell mounds. It's like those, all those things communicate, if not for, if not deliberately as communication, they do communicate anyway mm -hmm. by indicating the presence of other people in the past on the landscape. Yeah. And so and so um, history can be written in any number of ways, written, you know, loosely and metaphorical. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be mythologized, too. So that's another another way to look at it. A good exa uh, example I have right off the top of my head because I did a video about it, um, you know, on like uh, the archaeological evidence of uh, it, berserkers and, you know, Europe, um, you know, which originates ar archaeologically, as far as we can tell, uh, in a, the Indo-European cultures in Central Asia, um, where they would like using, uh, and I use shamanic uh, loosely because shaman is sort of, is sort of a loaded term that it shouldn't be always used in certain areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, but for the lack of a better term, shamanically would uh, ingest dog and wolf bones and then wear wolf pelts to the uh, uh, in a paper written by uh, Dr. Uh, w. Anthony, who's a elite, one of the more well-known Indo-European archaeologists, um, he, he talked about that, where it was like maybe like a warrior initiation. Uh, but anyways, regardless of that, you know, the in, several thousand years later, that was about 2000 BCE, um, you know, 4000 uh, uh, BP. Uh, it's like uh, several thousand years later, in round. 200 uh, BCE to 100 CE uh, in the Sarmatian culture, who did not technically have writing Sarmatians, um, unfortunately were popularized in that crappy King Arthur movie with uh, Clive Owen, <laughs> who's a good actor, but that movie itself was, was ridiculous pseudo history. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, the Sarmatian Knights, which were an actual culture, and yes, Marcus Aurelius did ship them over there as sort of mercenaries. But anyways, uh, they have these gold gorgets in like bands that depict werewolf people sort of fighting and slaying dragons. And so the, in the paper that brought that up, uh, and in my video, uh, that seems to be maybe a mythologization of uh, of those ancient sort of wolf warriors who, you know, donned the wolf mm -hmm. uh, pelt uh, and were professional warriors. Uh, and the Sarmatians were sort of a, uh, were descendants of one of the Indo-European offshoots, the Indo-Iranians. So, you know, they mythologized these people and then they carved it into gold bands. So those gold bands could technically be considered uh, part of writing as well. You know, could be considered mm -hmm. a kind of writing. It's like they're telling their ancestors' history. They may not mm -hmm. know it's their history. They may think, or well, actually, a lot of times myth is based off of historical events. Um, so they think it's their history, but it's changed into myth. But it's still them writing down their history. 
So that's another thing to, you know, to look at too. Right. And, and for, for cultural insiders, they would see that and recognize what it is. Whereas an outsider might look at it and say, oh, that looks like a crazy mythological thing. But for, for a cultural insider, yeah. it's like, oh, we, I understand what that's communicating. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and so that's things that, and they, these are sort of the questions that archaeologists consider or have been considering the past 50 years. Because, yes, unfortunately, archaeology uh, in the uh, 1900s through 1940s and sort of the 50s had a dark history we 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 can't cover it up and we shouldn't cover it up but we we can acknowledge it and move on and better it and not make those mistakes again uh we know better so we can do better yeah exactly yeah unfortunately um, that did happen uh <laughs> so so right. uh but but these are the questions that since that sort of i don't want to say renaissance but sort of improvements and uh realizing that maybe we shouldn't be acting like the nazis in the indiana jones movies <laughs> uh mm -hmm. which yes the yes the and nazis in those movies did do those things unfortunately uh for the most part they didn't go they didn't they did go into africa they didn't go to egypt they went to ethiopia which is an interesting and a whole nother thing but you know we don't need to be acting like them we need to be asking these questions what is you know how do we quantify writing you know how do we quantify um the beginning of periods and ending of periods such as you know because that's blurry in itself i mean for example the very um, blurry yeah our, the archaic uh, the adena culture appeared in the late archaic and then went into the early woodland and sort of into the middle woodland and you know exactly so right i mean at some point we have to draw boundaries as archaeologists yeah. and i mean in terms of projectile point styles there's a lot of overlap between late mm -hmm. archaic and early woodland and even early gotta, gotta look for the addition of pottery yeah exactly and so that's a, so that's a, sort of uh where i think we're, we're going to leave it is that you know you, this is how you get into archaeology but uh when you're going into archaeology these are the questions you need to start sort of asking because believe me when you apply to graduate school they're going to ask you what you want to do research what do you want to do and you're going to have to yep. i i had to uh and uh you're gonna to have to explain what you want to do so these are the questions that you're going to want to ask uh most definitely um uh and believe me you can if you explain it well enough you can get in even if you say you want to do two theses at once which is what i did and it was caught off guard when they actually accepted me <laughs> i thought i was gonna to have to uh you can pick between one or the other and they're like nope we'll take it <laughs> so, so uh so yeah and and I, so most definitely you can be an archaeologist any way you want be it volunteer uh which is what i what i did and dr Indodino did uh through our, our early careers and then you know uh you can become professional archaeologists uh by working at you, you know by getting an anthropology degree and then going into these different fields so uh, with that, I'm going to leave uh, our viewers. Uh, please uh, like, share, and subscribe to the movie. And uh, thank you to Dr. Indodino for joining us. And I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yep. Yo, you're very welcome. And thank you again. So, <laughs> anytime. Yep.